Uh, welcome everyone to the second lecture in the College of Architecture's lecture series titled Calibrations, the Space of Practice. Our speaker tonight is Seku Cook, an architectural practitioner and educator in Syracuse, New York, where he is currently an assistant professor of architecture in the School of Architecture at Syracuse University. His lecture this afternoon is titled Life and Times. Our moderators this afternoon are visiting instructor Alessandra Garcia and College of Architecture students Panache Siachetema, Narcisse Holmes, and Chioma Wakchukwu. Um, if I've uh, mangled your names, please forgive me. Um, now, Siku Cook is a Jamaican born architect and educator whose work situates itself at the intersection of the academy and practice. From early in his career, he has focused on built work that engages both architecture's conceptual aspirations and the realities of construction, as well as entrepreneurship. Through his professional practice, Siku Cook Studio, he combines insightful architectural processes with robust and rigorous experimentation and applies these to a wide array of work, ranging from commercial and residential projects on the East Coast, New York, New Jersey, and North Carolina, to speculative developments in both Liberia and his native Jamaica. Siku's current research centers on the emergent field of hip hop architecture, a theoretical construction reflecting the core tenets of hip hop culture with the agency to create a meaningful impact on the built environment and give voice to marginalized and uh, the, the marginalized and unrepresented within design practice. This work has been widely disseminated through his writings, lectures, and symposia, and was the central focus of a major exhibition entitled Close to the Edge, the Birth of Hip Hop Architecture. And, and at Springbrooks in St. Paul, Minnesota. Oh, I'm sorry, the birth of hip hop architecture was at the AIA New York Center for Architecture. Uh, and, and it was also uh, presented at Springbrooks in St. Paul, Minnesota. He will be featured in the upcoming exhibition, Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Siko holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell University and a Master of Architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. He is licensed to practice in both New York and California, and he has initiated key collaborations for competition entries, building proposals, and building commissions in, uh, in both states. Please help me uh, welcome Siko to, to the College of Architecture at at uh, Texas Tech, and uh, I will now hand it over to our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, thanks for the introduction and um, for hosting me at the College of Architecture. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Ursula Kripa, who reached out to me first off. Um, I met Ursula a few years back when she was at WashU and um, have followed her career since then. Um, and uh, also I wanted to mention Sarah Aziz who wanted to, to invite me to uh, TTU last year, um, but the schedules didn't quite work out. So um, thanks to her as well. And, and especially to the students, I, I, I um, at least in Ursula's invitation, she mentioned that the students played a big role in, in deciding who they wanted to invite for the lecture series. So it's a big honor to know that the students are thinking about the work that's happening in the world and identifying people that they want to come talk with them. Uh, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, this, this year or you know, this last few months has been quite crazy in, in many ways. Um, and uh, this semester is also quite uh, packed for me for many different reasons. Um, and I've actually received several 
several invitations to speak all over the place um, for this semester. And most of them I turned down, um, primarily because they were, you know, panels on blackness in architecture or, um, you know, come talk to our students about how we change the state of race relationship in, in architecture or what is it like to be a black architect in America? Um, and uh, although I'm flattered by the, the newfound um, attention to me as a black architect in those arenas, um, I, I turned them down because it was mostly about, it seemed mostly about tokenization of, of, of the very few practicing black architects that they could find. And, um, not really thinking about you know the work that's being done and how that work can be can be related so hopefully uh today you know, this was a great opportunity the invitation was 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 about my work so um i really enjoy talking about my work and so that's what i'll be doing today um and uh obviously my work um surrounds a lot of those topics and we'll be getting into some of that stuff but um it's 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 not the primary focus of what the talk will be the primary focus will be really a, a kind of reflection on the different types of work that i've done um obviously hip-hop architecture has become central to some of that and we'll talk about how um some of that work shows some of the exhibitions and um project into some of the work that's in progress right now what that might mean um, and also life and times is, is, uh, is, you know, it sounded better than current work or work in progress. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a reference to, to volume three. So it could be life and times of S cook instead of right life and times of S Carter. So maybe some people pick up that reference. So I'll open talking about practice and practice as disassociated from the specific theoretical work and curatorial work and experimental work that I've been doing around hip hop architecture. Um, practice just as a mode of getting architectural thought into built space, right? So um, I, I definitely spent quite a lot of my early career just engaging in in really um, hands-on practice work. I was lucky enough to do some of my first project management just six months out of, out of, of um, Cornell and uh, really developed a real love for the job site, for things that get built in the world. So um, some of the stuff may not seem very conceptually um, progressive, but it's, it's work that I really cherish and it's work that I think really connects the theoretical work to some of the work that I'm doing right now. So I think it's all quite important to show in a, in a presentation like this. And, and um, forgive me if you've seen most of this stuff before, a lot of this stuff is on my website. Uh, I did receive uh, some of the, some early student questions, which I hope I'll be answering today. Um, and one of them was about, um, referred to the lecture that I gave at Cornell. So maybe 50% of this lecture was, was in that lecture at Cornell from uh, 2019. So hopefully you can bear that to get to some of the newer conversations. Um, so uh, I'll show a few quick projects or a few projects quickly. Um, this is the Eat to Live Food Co-op in Syracuse. And um, this is one of the first new construction on the south side of Syracuse, which is um, the, the most densely pop, uh, the area of the city that's most densely populated by African Americans. Um, and this was done with a group called the South Side Initiative, where we were um, developing a food co-op for, for the community. Um, this was the, the first uh, ground up building that I'd done by myself. And so it, 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 it holds a, a, a space of pride in my heart. Um, and it's also still quite a, a, a great space, even though the business model has changed multiple times because of poor management or lack of fun, funding. Um, it's, it's still a quite an important um, building in the neighborhood. Uh, this next one is, 
is an addition to a house for rich or semi-rich clients in Maplewood, New Jersey. Um, but I still try to have fun with, with this project, um, bringing in some of the exterior materials into the interior, um, really, uh, really de demarcating the difference between the addition and what was existing so that we have that really clear differentiation. And, and you know, this is one of my favorite images of the toilet hanging off of the side of a shingled building. Um, so really, that's a bathroom and closet addition on top of a garage. Um, and then we also turned the entire attic into a new guest suite. Um, this is some, some earlier work, but work that still kind of stands up, you know, um, uh, early interior renovation projects in, in um, upstate New York. This one from my time in San Francisco, experimenting with different um, formal languages. Um, this was one of my earliest projects where um, I collaborated with Efren Perez to design this restaurant in, in Brooklyn, in, in um, Williamsburg, part of Brooklyn, which I think is still open today more than 15 years, more than 12 years later. Uh, a house in Syracuse that I designed and we took all the way to construction documents, but never got built. The clients decided against, against building um, a, a house of this kind in an area that had a, um, a market that was a little bit too low and then some competition entry stuff where um, this project, a kind of landscape intervention project in Syracuse uh, that was a finalist for a competition but did not end up being built. But again, another one of another fun project that I still quite like. Um, so uh, in talking about hip hop architecture, we'll start out with some of the theoretical positions. And hopefully this will very quickly answer some of the questions that I got from a couple of students early on about, you know, connecting um, uh, uh, music to architecture or a musical style to architecture. And the first thing I'll say is that it, it, it really has very little, if anything, to do with music specifically. It's um, really about a culture. So, um, and, and my work for this started with this piece called The Fifth Pillar, A Case for Hip Hop Architecture, where I was really laying out that case, right? That um, all of these different cultural aspects of hip hop um, have resulted in many different modes of production. So we can think of DJing as, as theater, um, graffiti is fine arts, b-boying as, as dance, and, and emceeing as, as music. But usually within any major movement, there's, five, there's a fifth pr product, which is architecture. And this was really questioning why hip hop didn't produce an architecture. And if it did, what does it look like, right? Or what is it? How can we identify it? And so after that piece, I thought I was kind of done with the topic. But then I decided that there was enough interest in that topic to, to, to put on an entire symposium here in Syracuse, where I brought 12 different thought leaders to really uh, dig into that subject matter over a couple of days. Um, and at the beginning of 2015, I thought that would be the, the end of hip hop architecture for me. But then that conversation really left more questions than answers. It really showed the depth and breadth of the topic. And um, so then I had to make a commitment that I was gonna take this on to be um, my primary research topic for the next five years. So if we're defining hip hop architecture, we have to kind of look at the two constituent parts. So we're understanding hip hop really as a cultural phenomenon um, and uh, how something that goes beyond its music as a, beyond a singular musical genre. Um, and we have to also define architecture as primarily something that is about people, right? That is ideally about people's concerns, about social concerns, about the way that people live in, in the world um, and not really just about form making or, or ideas. Um, so if we start there, 
then we, we have to realize, as I state here, that um, an architecture of hip hop is not only possible, but necessary, right? Um, and this is the most simple definition that I've ever um, made of hip hop architecture, which took me four or five years to, to come to. But in this interview for the show that I did in Minnesota, um, I was able to put it in a few simple words that it's basically hip hop culture in built form. Um, so short that it could be the title of the actual piece. Um, and then of course, the next big uh, statement or point in that trajectory was the, the exhibition, um, Close to the Edge, The Breath of Hip Hop Architecture at the Center for Architecture in New York. Um, and that's the, the headquarters of the AIA in New York. Um, so it was kind of a, a, a big deal for me to, to be accepted to put on an exhibition there. But it also began um, or was the mandate to expand the work that I was doing, um, the curatorial part of it, which was really collecting all these different examples and ideas around hip hop architecture that, um, that already existed and had existed since as far back as 1992 or 90, 1993. So part of the idea was one, deciding or presenting what does hip hop architecture look like? And the other was re reinforcing the idea that the fact that this is not a new idea, this is not a new concept that just came up in the last few years, right? Um, so the content of that show was quite varied from, um, from practitioners, people, doing speculative projects like this, this, this project by James Garrett Jr. Um, and this is an early model of that project where he's tapping into his roots as a, a graph writer um, to more speculative work by Olale Khan Jafis, who for me does some of the most amazing um, visually stunning work that I know is heavily influenced by his connection to hip hop culture, and also his training as an architect at Cornell. Um, and there's multiple works by him in the show. I think we had three different pieces of his or three different projects of his in the show, multiple images from each project. Um, this is Shanti Mega Structures, that's also from him. Um, and then some speculative work from, from me as well. This is a, a research project that I did that was about um, uh, trying to use the 3D printers as a digital fabrication tool that we could use in a, same, in a similar fashion as um, DJ's turntable. So how can we mix these prototypes, these very simple primitives of, of a house through the 3D printer and disrupt that process to create um, something new, an image for what um, buildings might look like as they become demolished in a neighborhood. Um, then there's work from FAT, which was Nat Belcher and Stephen Slaughter did this project called Harlem the Ghetto Fabulous uh, about 10 years before, um, where they were thinking about the kind of glitzy, glamorous aspect of how hip hop presents itself and using that as something, you know, all the good and bad elements of it to present a kind of new um, interior or space within, within Harlem. So very early speculative work by Craig Wilkins. This is a hip hop park that he designed in Chicago back in 1993. Um, and these are drawings, watercolors of trying to turn this derelict site into um, uh, something that is um, um, reflective of hip hop culture. Uh, we also found work internationally. So these are some international examples. This is work by Mar United Architects in the Netherlands, who um, have been interested in hip hop culture since the early 90s and bringing that into their architectural practice. Um, and they collaborated with a couple of graffiti artists, well known graffiti artists in Europe, um, Zeds and Delta, to create these images of, of, of three dimensional, immersive three dimensional environments coming out of graffiti. Delta himself has also gone, gone into the architectural realm in different ways in his installations. So he's now no longer 
relegated to the two-dimensional surface, but able to break that down into various layers of materials that all um, are reflecting his same, um, his same ideas and lenses about hip hop culture, about graffiti. And then later even, um, even uh, collaborating with architects in the Netherlands to redesign uh, or to design a, a new facade that was based on some of his early graffiti drawings and then you know figuring out the brick patterns that would create this um, pseudo 2d 3d surface out of brick and we were even able to to include a better uh, a full um a full version of that excuse me um i'm also in my my studio so don't mind that that's my dog he's gonna come in and and get loud from here from time to time um so uh then found examples as far in as australia so this is in melbourne um projects by itn architects this one called end to end where they took a, a entire subway car car with graffiti and turned it into a restaurant space on top of an existing building or one that is more directly about graffiti where they literally extrude a graffiti piece from the side of the building, which isn't as excited as some of the other aspects like these windows, these, these arrow shaped windows, or the most hip hop aspect of this project to me, which is the goldfish tank in the ceiling. Um, I can't really imagine anything that's much more baller than that. Um, and by the way, sorry, I didn't give the disclaimer at the beginning about my, my dog. He's just part of my real space. Um, I also sometimes show images of my, my, of my studio before a lecture, at the beginning of a lecture to talk about how I work. But right now you can actually just see my whole studio in the background. Anyway, so um, we also had a bunch of uh, student work in there by different studios that were looking at hip hop architecture in the last few years. So um, Chris Cornelius at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee has run a hip hop architecture studio for the last two or three, uh, last four or five years, um, three different cycles. So this is some work from his studio um, where the students were designing a, a hip hop museum or a museum of hip hop in Brooklyn. Uh, I also, uh, ran a couple um, hip hop architecture studios here at Syracuse. This is work from one of those, the, the first studios. This is a diagram by Kyle Simmons, breaking down various layers of uh, the hierarchy of graffiti to then inform how you go about building a singular building with multiple cohorts of people designing and building on top of each other at the same time. So these are some examples of what that work looked like um, and how it was the model that was built into the wall, into the, the actual presentation surface instead of being um, placed onto the surface. Uh, more work from that same studio, this one looking more at the graphic aspects of graffiti and how it can code or it can become a coded language. Uh, and then we can use that to decode movements and densities of people in the city. And then that can in turn become different uh, landscape moves like benches and tables and amphitheaters in the, on the cityscape in DC. And then a third example from that same hip hop architecture studio in DC, where um, this, this student was looking at the actual structure of a hip hop track and how it's sampled from multiple pieces and how those samples are spliced together and using that as a way of reading the histories of a certain neighborhood in the city and um, designing and developing a new uh, pathway that recalls and revives some of the lost histories in this area. So multiple time periods are existing in the same eye shot and being turned into spaces for public use. So the design of the space was also a, a, um, a challenge, a completely separate challenge than curating. So um, curating is more about collecting the work, identifying it and organizing it. Um, 
the design work is, is definitely um, where I had to lean on some of my practice experience. So the first idea was just to take a massive 40 foot shipping container as an existing thing and just place it inside the entire Center for Architecture space. Um, and then instead of, um, instead of uh, painting the walls, you know, any, any gallery space where you have to repaint the walls over and over, instead of doing that in a single flat color, we would invite a graffiti artist to then um, tag all the interior walls and create murals on the walls and then chop up the, um, the shipping container pieces as the backdrop for all the pieces that would be in the space. So it, it identified a couple of really critical parts of, of hip hop architectural theory, which is about layering is a really important aspect and then reuse of existing materials is another aspect and then transforming the inner interior space using graffiti is also quite um, an important aspect of any hip hop architectural design. So then we had to lay out exactly where all this work was gonna go, how it's gonna be organized within the space uh, on top of the shipping containers. Um, we're also lucky to work with um, great graphic designers. Uh, we should do it all, um, Jonathan Jackson and Sarah Nelson Jackson, um, and the graffiti artist Chino, who is also a legendary graffiti artist. He did all the graffiti for the show, for all the, the labels, all the, the, um, the window text, the wall text, um, for the poster as well. Um, and so uh, the fabrication of the, of the space started with identifying uh, a shipping container, was able to go to our shipping container yard and pick the one that we wanted. Um, the evergreen one stood out to me because it's such an iconic logo. So this is the actual container that we got before um, it got chopped up and shipped to New York. Um, this is the process of us um, getting it chopped up in Syracuse. Um, I should say us, this is really the fabricator that did all this. Um, and I just kind of told him what to do. Um, I get my hands dirty sometimes and this time I didn't have to get my hands too dirty. But uh, this is really showing that process of chopping it up into different pieces, organizing it all, cleaning it up, um, labeling each one of them, and, and then testing out what it looks like with the, with the, with the labels, what it looks like with the frame pieces, and then painting the inside of each of those panels in this um, hyper glossy white. Um, so to me, that was representative of the baseline of our collective baseline understandings of architecture um, as a kind of backdrop for um, the work that goes beyond architecture. And in the back of it, we maintain the, the, um, the, the raw green evergreen logos. So the installation of the exhibition started with the first layer. Um, actually the first layer, if you can see around here, are, are leftover traces of the show that were, was installed previously. I was pretty adamant about them not, um, not cleaning up the surfaces and making it all perfect, but just using what was there, what existed. And then Chino came in and then, um, you know, did all his graffiti handwriting on the walls. And these are, all of the text is um, quotes from graffiti, from hip hop tracks that mention architecture or design or the built environment in one way or another. Um, so this is some of that. And then, um, so this is one of the most beautiful time periods of the show's installation. Um, then we have to put the grounds in for the supports for all of the shipping container panels that each weighs anywhere from like 30 pounds to 70 pounds. Um, and then organizing those starting with the corner, the kind of keystone piece. Um, and then downstairs, uh, the model supports also were part of the design. So each of these um, pedestals is at a different height, it's kind of a, a three-dimensional image of an equalizer. That was the idea behind it. And then Chino came in at the end to put in some of the finishing touches. So hand graffiti on top of some of the images on the wall, and then 
this leftover space that was the, the stairway between the first floor and the mezzanine, might as well put another graffiti piece in there, which is, you know, stairwells are usually pretty active spaces for graffiti. Um, and then we had a video wall. So this is actually just a few minutes before the opening of the show. And this is just when I was having a little bit of a meltdown because we weren't quite ready with all the video, but it all turned out fine at the opening. So this is what the show looked like when it was opened. Um, um, some of these images are from the pre-opening and then the opening itself. This is the line outside for people coming in. We actually had, um, this was after the opening, this was in the opening itself. Um, we actually ended up having almost 500 people um, show up at the, at the opening, one of the largest openings they've ever had at the Center for Architecture. Um, these are some of the finished images of what the show looked like. Um, even the info text starts with that first layer of the traces of the previous the previous project and then graffiti and then the the vinyl text on top of that. Some of the info walls that you know introducing a kind of glossary of terms for the museum visitor to watch just to, to understand or to, to read through. Um, uh, we fabricated custom model shelves out of the shipping container pieces to have some of these um, live models in the space. And then the video wall was kind of a collage of multiple videos, a projection, and then seven videos at different sizes. Um, and these are all videos of lectures or, or TED Talks or symposia or, um, or music videos all about hip hop and architecture. And the stairwell, as we talked about, going down to the mezzanine. And then the mezzanine is where we showed that um, this, this part of the show, which is called On Form, where we um, basically stripped all the models of work that was in the main show. We stripped these digital models of their context, their materiality, their, um, their color, and just rendered them all in white and presented them with this open question about whether hip hop architecture had a discernible architectural form, right? Again, one of my favorite parts of the show. Um, this is text and an image from the B-sides of the show, which is really um, other leftover or other like tangential architectural movements that, um, that are part of architecture, but not explicitly hip hop architecture, but might relate. So um, what I'm calling um, uh, neo-postmodernism, Afrofuturism, activist architecture, informal settlements, and deconstructivism all share some formal or procedural relationship with hip hop architecture, but really are not the same thing at all, right? And then the last part of the show was the audio booth, which we call Black Noise and where you could listen to clips of some of the songs that were in the main show. And then the, um, you know, some interviews and podcasts sp spliced in there. And then um, we also had um, all this, these tags on the walls, these labels, these kind of things that graffiti artists are used to, these name tags that then people started to graffiti all the way through the show. And by the end of the show, this entire space was covered in tags. So that show then moved to St. Paul, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the process, the kind of headache or the almost impossible uh, way that that show came about. Um, I went through that pretty extensively at the talk in, at Cornell last time. Um, if you're really interested, you can look at that, that video. Um, but the great thing about that, this show was that it was not in a center for architecture they didn't have that had two museum staff dedicated and all these resources this was just in uh, a kind of abandoned leftover garage not really abandoned but a leftover garage of what used to be a used car dealership that was going to be turned into this new center called Springbox um, for springboard for the arts um, and something about the rawness of the space was really attractive and um, really quite authentic and so we took that space and installed 
the same show. We had to redesign a lot of it. You know, we didn't have all these beautiful walls to, 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 um, to support all the shipping containers. So we had to create this framework to support, to support the work. We didn't have the mezzanine anymore. So now we had space for a little bit more work. Um, the graffiti on the walls was done by three or four different graffiti artists instead of one. So that was quite different. But it, all in all, it was still quite a really um, impressive collection of work that came together really beautifully. Um, so these are some installation images of that show. You can see some models on that shelf as well. Um, another model from, you know, representing the model from Kyle Simmons. Um, and the video wall at the end. The really powerful part about this show is that we were able to see the entire backside of the shipping container. And luckily the evergreen logo came back together really beautifully. Um, and then the, the on form section was the one area of the entire show that had professional lighting on it. So that part of the show really glowed. Um, so this is what that looked like a bit close up. Um, and then the black noise audio booth just became this thing in the corner of the space. We just spray painted everything in that corner black and then gave people headphones to have access to the, the work. So images from the opening, um, people are starting to gather. This show was there, it was supposed to be there for three months. We extended it for about four and a half to about four and a half months. And we had all kinds of people come through there from the community and all these community events that happened at that time. And it was quite um, an actively engaged uh, um, uh, exhibition, which again, became something that was much more authentic, much more in keeping with the identity of the people in this, this area and um, was really quite well appreciated by all in attendance. So, um, I wanted to wrap up with some work in progress. Um, you know, I, I talk, uh, I've done similar talks multiple times and, and I try not to show exactly the same thing every time. Um, I think in the past or maybe long before I even started lecturing, um, the people would give exactly the same lecture over and over again because with exactly the same slides because the audiences were so different and it was way before YouTube. You had to be there in person to actually see any of the, any of the lecture content. But now I, I feel, um, uh, and also for people showing up, I kind of feel, want them to see new work, something that's, that's really happening that's on the drawing boards right now. But a lot of the work in progress that I want to talk about is work that is connecting some of the early practice work, some of the practice work that I showed at the beginning of the lecture with um, some of the work around hip hop architecture and really seeing how those two things can start to come together to define a new kind of practice. Um, so the first project I'll talk about is, is called The Good Life. Um, uh, it's for uh, an organization called the Good Life Foundation. We're actually calling the, the space uh, Shock or Syracuse Hip Hop Headquarters. Um, S-H-H-H-Q. Um, and so it starts with this building, which is a, about a 40,000 square foot um, former dairy on the west side of Syracuse, a building that's been abandoned for about 10 years that our client just acquired or, or acquired the rights to use. Um, and it's covered in all this beautiful graffiti. And it reminds me of, um, this project or this building, Five Points, that used to exist in Long Island City in Queens. And there's a whole controversial, controversial story about how this all got um, painted over and then demolished that you should read up on. Um, actually, there's a lawsuit after that that, um, that the artist won for destroying their, their priceless works of art. Um, so, uh, so this is the aerial view of the building uh, and some of its surrounding. There's a, a major throughway to the, to the east called West Street. And then on the west side, there's a, there's a residential, a low-income housing community. But it's kind of a corridor of an emerging 
arts district, a few different arts focused buildings are down there. Um, and so the main strategy was to accept this um, almost derelict uh, image of the building, something that where we, we would preserve a lot of the CMU block and the brick, but treat the building as kind of a shell, a really open shell. And then all the shell pieces we would cover in graffiti, would allow to keep being covered in graffiti over and over. And then, each, and then we have these inserted new pieces um, in different critical or strategic locations that are then these white glossy boxes of new insertion where the newer part of the program is gonna be. And those would also reflect a different aspect of graffiti, but more of a, an image of what the graffiti was on the building and, and reifying that, concretizing that into um, some of the architectural panels that are there. So you can kind of see how in these two elevations, uh, again, these are work in drawings, um, here where the graffiti is now taking the texture of the standing seam siding and the, um, the frosting of the glass is also covered in that same graffiti, but everything is still in white to contrast with all the colored pieces everywhere else. And some of the interior sections, you can start to see how the graffiti becomes this large scale thing that goes through multiple floors, but really imp imprints itself on the, on the facade of, of the new, newly inserted pieces that are inserted into this shell. So you can kind of tell from these sections the, where the shell is and where the inserts are. And so, as I said, the exterior of it would be graffiti, but we imagine it kind of uh, a curated graffiti, similar to um, how Five Points used to run. So that was run by an organization where they would invite graffiti artists from all over the place to come in and transform the building on a regular basis. So we imagine that once a year, there would be a kind of a big festival and different muralists, different graffiti artists would keep um, transforming the, the surfaces of the building over and over again on the interior and exterior and hopefully keeping the white pieces white. Um, so there's some visualization of that. And then programmatically thinking about different sections of the building that would become you know, a business incubator for different businesses in the community or some of the training programs that they run through the Good Life Foundation. Um, and I should mention that the Good Life Foundation is focused on empowering um, teens and young adults through learning through um, hip hop culture. So using hip hop culture as a tool for teaching about entrepreneurship. So the business incubator is really important. Then also uh, a recording studio as a way of recording, but also a way of, of, of generating income for the space. Um, a print studio on the, in some of the existing spaces. That's also another um, income generator. Some of the kids use this to generate income for themselves. Um, and then using some of the exterior spaces as, um, as garden spaces, like roof gardens, right? Um, and uh, we were lucky enough to be, um, we are lucky enough to be uh, collaborating with Sarah Zude of, of, of Studio Zude, um, who's a really amazing landscape architect, currently a professor at, of landscape architecture at the GSD at Harvard. And um, she's working with us on some of the landscape components of this project. Um, another project in, in Syracuse, again, this is on the south side. This is for a, um, this is for um, a church organization that's developing a community center with a big basketball court and gym. Um, this drawing, the line weights on this drawing aren't as pleasing as the previous drawing, but um, so, uh, and, and here where some of the, the main ideas are creating this really large clear story space. That's the long span area, which where the, the basketball court would be. Um, and on the west elevation, you can kind of see some of that. 
And then, um, you know, so that, that clear story is a kind of collage thing. So it's, it's, it's reminiscent of, of, of a few different things, but it also allows things like text to be, um, uh, you know, uh, layered onto the glass. Um, imagery, so some of this pixelated imagery, this is a project by Hood Design, um, Walter Hood's pro um, company out in California. Um, or even getting the community involved, getting some of the kids involved in drawing or art, ex art projects that we could then turn into stained glass and using stained glass as a reference back to the church itself that used to have these big stained glass windows that got taken out. Um, the other aspect of this elevation is um, these little uh, bump out dormer things. Um, we're actually imagining them as, um, as remnants, physical, like real physical remnants of some of the buildings that are around in the neighborhood that are also owned by the church that are now vacant um, that would be coming down anyway. So instead of, so similar to what we did with the shipping container, we would chop this up into sections and use it as part of the facade. So we're literally taking some of these theoretical ideas of chopping and spinning and the DJ techniques and bringing it into the facade. So this is another exterior rendering of what that project would be. Um, and a couple of quick interiors of, of that. Um, and then uh, final project I'll talk about, um, I'm showing some imagery that's a little bit premature, but um, it's just before being publicly released. But these are all images that are gonna be in a publication uh, that will accompany the, the exhibition at MoMA. Um, again, that, that exhibition is called Reconstructions, uh, Architecture and Blackness in America. And it was supposed to open in October of this year, but of course, due to COVID got pushed back and, and is now, um, should be opening in, in the spring, in um, February. Um, and so in this project, I'm actually looking at all of the different layers of history of a certain section of Syracuse um, that uh, is now the Civic Center. It's where the interstate cuts through the, the entire project. And it's also um, where, uh, you know, it's, it's where um, the major public housing projects are now. Um, and the idea is to kind of mix a lot of that history, reveal some of those histories with, uh, Imagine what the new project is going to be in there, and you know this area has a history of this of placement and displacement. So instead of displacing people again, we wanted to really trace the history of displacement with um, the intersections of all of these different layers of what used to happen there, um, and turning that into the major, um, the main projects of display in the in the in the exhibition. So I'll be building models of this and doing some, um, some original pieces around this for the exhibition itself. And then I'll just end with a couple of things, you know, real work in progress. If you follow my Instagram at all, you'll see some of this, this uh, work on trace that I'm always showing. Um, even in a simple project like this, I'm trying to have layers of things remnants of past histories of a, reno of a project that's being renovated or a new, um, some really fresh new ideas uh, about designing ADUs in Los Angeles for the city of Los Angeles and um, yeah, really early stuff. So, and then finally, um, just to put the plug in there, um, all of this is coming together into a book that I finished writing last September also was supposed to come out in October, but has been pushed back to the spring. But I'm really happy to see the final graphics of the cover and the layouts coming together. And the book should be out uh, early next year. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing, wonderful. As a fellow musician, I found it really um, captivating to see the different interpretations of music and the culture of music through, through space and design. 
I want to introduce uh, now Panache Siachitema, who has prepared a, a question or two. And then uh, we're, gonna, we're going to take some questions from the chat for you, Zaiku, if that's okay with you. Sure, absolutely. Yes, uh, hello. Um, so first off, uh, in your Q&A at Cornell, uh, you mentioned how actual buildings that are termed hip hop architecture are at the bottom of the total, totem pole. Can you expand more on exactly what you're meaning by this uh, statement and how are you focusing that energy in your uh, practice? Um, yeah, uh, um, I saw that, that, I saw that, that question earlier this week when I got them or a couple of days ago and I was tempted to go back to the lecture and, and listen to the whole thing just to get the context again. Um, I, I don't recall it completely, but I think, um, I think it was really about uh, what's important for me going forward as I'm developing my, my own practice, right? And um, so uh, as, as you've seen, it started out with writing, it started out with theorizing, started out with gathering multiple voices and theories around the idea. Um, and then it went into some experimentation, uh, collecting, curating, bringing different examples together and thinking about those and looking at those. Um, then it got into really doing some early research tests of my own to think through this, this idea or these ideas and how they come together. Um, and, and, and then ex exhibiting some of that stuff, right? So exhibitions. Um, so, uh, and now I'm seeing some of that stuff really just creep into the practice um, as a kind of general practice. Um, and it's, it's more important to me that some of these ideas and tenets and processes um, and really ideologies get um, uh, inserted into architectural discourse in general um, than having a specific genre of, of building types that we identify as hip hop architecture. I think that is, um, and I talk a little bit about this in my book and I wish I could talk about this after everyone has read the book, but um, I talk about uh, how, um, you know, that, that might be the actual death knell for the whole movement. Once the movement becomes a singular image, <laughs> of a singular building, then it's done, right? Then it's no longer something that's challenging um, various precepts of architecture or the way that we think about architecture. And I think over the last few months, we've all been challenging ourselves to think through different ways of, 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 of being in the world or being in this, in this discipline. Like what is our real relationship to architecture, right? So those are the ideas that are so much more important to me than um, having specific people design specific buildings that are fall specifically under the title hip hop architecture. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yes, it does. Sure. Thank you, Zaiku. Narcisse? Hello, um, so I'm gonna ask a few questions from the Q&A um, and then I'll ask a question of my own after. Sure. Uh, but, um, Anna, she was wondering, would you consider the Soho building by John Schultz hip hop That's architecture? Not. No. Okay. Um, I, I'm excited to hear that actually there actually is a, a building, a Soho building by John Sott. I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, so John is somebody who I, I know and have um, communicated with. I, I discovered his work Geez, I can't remember when I, dis I discovered his work after the first exhibition um, and I was blown away by it. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I haven't heard of this guy. Um, and since then I've found out more about his work. I've seen some of his videos. Um, the videos that he does are amazing. Um, he did saw a series of drawings that are really amazing and I included a lot of that work in, um, or some of that work in, in my book and an interview with him in my book as well. So um, 
his work is definitely embodied in, in under the topic of hip hop architecture on some of the things that I'm thinking about and, and looking at. Um, I can't recall. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't, he didn't tell me about a building that he was doing in Soho. I would have to take a look at it. Whatever it is, I'm hoping it is. <laughs> I, I think the way that he, he, he works definitely is in that, in that space. Right. Um, but at the same time, I'm still hesitant to label, to, to, um, to ascribe that label to one person or, or, or another. And I, um, I wanted to, you know, I really don't want to be the person that people come to and, and wanting a kind of stamp of approval. <laughs> so it's like Sekou Cook approved, uh, Hip hop architecture. I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, and so the next question is from Professor Shea. Um, so he said recently hip hop culture has circulated on the new digital platforms and has intersected with feminism. Might you speak a bit about how you imagine these social and technological intersections, uh, how these will in, uh, intersections will influence the future shape of hip hop architecture in your work and the work of others? Yeah, great question. I think um, I have been thinking and and about that and dealing with that in many ways thus far. Um, so uh, again, a lot of these conversations, I, I feel like <laughs> um, the book itself came out of a desire to to explore as many of these ideas as thoroughly as possible and give myself the time and space to do that. And now that I have completed it, I become more and more frustrated by the fact that nobody has read it yet <laughs> because it takes so damn long between finishing a manuscript and getting a, an academic publication out. So um, I, yeah, so um, hopefully a lot of these questions will become illuminated really soon. But um, yeah, I talk about um, intersections with, with feminism. I talk about intersection with activist architecture. I talk about intersections with with race, um, intersections with location and different trajectories of where hip hop culture is going. But the, really the, the, the goal of the book, the primary goal of the book, just like the goal of the, the exhibition was, to, shift, was to, to expand on what does hip hop architecture look like. The goal of the book is really to create a, a theoretical groundwork upon which as many people in as many different ways can build, right? Um, so if somebody is really um, particularly fascinated in, in um, environmentalism or landscape discourse or, um, or feminism or, or conservatism or, you know, neo-Nazism or whatever ism there is, they can, try to find uh, some kind of intersectionality within the base of the work themselves. And then, it, and then a lot of the responsibility and onus comes off of my shoulders. Like I don't have to do all of that intersectional work myself. People can then engage with the work um, and take it in whatever direction they want to. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I just have one more question. This is a question of my own. And it's actually about your exhibit in New York. Mm -hmm. um, so I know for hip hop, for many, um, it kind of carries a negative connotation with like the culture that's behind it. Yep. And so I know that some of the materials and like medians that you use to display graffiti in the show was like the stairwell and you chose to use the shipping crate and cut it up. Did you use that because those usually also have negative connotations like the dark CD stairwell and like the shipping crate that you see in a lot of like uh, music videos for hip hop culture? kind of to bring it to a better light like you're doing with hip hop. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of that's embedded in there, right? Um, I think that's one of those um, unintended or unintentional, inexplicit um, things that happen. But um, because it's buried in the work, it comes out anyway, right? So I didn't set out and say, well, I'm going to do the the stairwell thing because stairwells are really have a negative connotation to them. And I want to elevate the negative connotation to something that people can appreciate. Um, but 
there was, there's a general sense in the work that these are things that people overlook or underappreciate or things that people think are dark and scary and negative because of the dominant worldview. And we're all so awoken to that right now that um, the dominant, the, the primary way that we get our image of culture or reality is through a very singular lens of white male dominated culture, right? So if it's not, if it's not coming from that, that point of view, then it's other, then it's less than, then it's bad, then it's negative, right? Um, without looking at it itself and, and thinking about what are its own internal negative constructs or its own things that, that don't work, right? So, you know, um, there's this terrifying memo that comes out that's talking about um, not, um, not allowing any federal agencies to teach to have to teach their employees about anti-racist, anti-racism, or any history of the country that labels it as a racist country. And it's like, every, we have to just say that our country is good and it's all pure. And it shows this lack of internal uh, reflection. Um, so yeah, some of those things are intent in there, not as explicitly as you're saying, um, and we talk about hip hop culture in general as this negative thing, but, and how it's sexist, how it's misogynist, how it's homophobic, how it's violent. Um, and the thing, what I, what I, how I address that now, and there's a great story in the opening of the book where I talk about this is that, you know, architecture is, is racist and misogynistic and homophobic and violent and sexist. Uh, but we don't talk about, you know, why are we practicing architecture? It's such a terrible event. But you get these questions about why hip hop? It's such a terrible thing, right? So yeah, I think in whatever way hip hop architecture or hip hop architectural practice can elevate these ideas of um, things that are thrown away that are seemingly negative and make them more positive, then um, I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you. And so I have a question for you from Chris Taylor. Um, he would like to thank you for the great work. Um, and he's curious of how or if the Carl Walker curated exhibition, you know, the Roughneck Constructivists at ICA Philadelphia, particularly, you know, thinking as well as like um, Arthur Jaffa's, how it factors into your momentum, you know. And he's also curious about the potential connections and magnifications between your work and what Theaster Gates has been doing in the Dorchester area of South um, Chicago. Yeah, um, great references. Um, as a matter of fact, in a different lecture, I, I might have forwarded most of that stuff. Um, actually, in a different lecture, I have. <laughs> uh, the, the 2016 lecture that I did at um, the Center for Architecture which was before the exhibition um, um, by a couple of years, uh, I talk about, I, it's, it's a really heavily theoretical lecture. Um, and I was about to say that at the onset of this lecture that this one is probably gonna be more about practice, more about work. Again, um, the, the title Life and Times is more about looking at my own work within these times and the times I'm kind of bracketing at as you know, within the last eight to 10 years. Um, but if this were a lecture specifically about hip hop architecture, it wouldn't have started without talking about roughneck constructivism. Um, uh, that, that show completely blew my mind when I found it. And it's one of my foundational texts um, in, the th in, in putting the, together the theory. And some of my writing in the past has, has referenced it quite a bit and it's definitely a part of the book. Um, as well, I would have talked about Theaster Gates and what he's, doing, what he's done in Dorchester. Um, again, he's probably somebody who's not gonna say he's explicitly uh, empowered by hip hop or following hip hop tenets, um, but he's operating in a way that, is, that embodies the, the hip hop spirit. Like he's just doing things 
um, completely changing the game without anybody's permission. He's just kind of transforming a neighborhood, redesigning buildings and creating new centers without somebody telling him, wait, you're not an architect. You don't have all the permissions to do all these things. And instead of telling him that he can't do this or he's done something wrong, the city came to him and said, how are you doing this? How can we get some of what you're doing? Because they had been struggling with this revitalization project on the South side for forever. And he just figured it out by doing it himself. Um, so his work is really quite beautiful and is definitely part of my previous lectures. And luckily I was able to incorporate it into the book as well. Thank you. We have another question from Professor Robert Pearl and he asks, near the beginning, you said you were not connecting with hip hop music. Why not? Um, so, yeah, I saw, I was reading that, that question. Um, I think I, just to be clear, um, I was gonna say it's not connected with the music. I'm saying that it's not only about the music, right? And I think the, the trouble is that when people think hip hop, they're only thinking about a genre of music. And, um, and then they ask questions like, what's the rock and roll architecture? What's the, the, the um, you know, what's the uh, country music architecture? What's the, you know, and that's, that's too limited uh, um, an understanding. Um, and we have to think about hip hop as not just another singular version of music, but it's, it's a complete movement. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a creative, cultural, social movement. And I argue quite openly that it is the dominant culture of our time, right? Virtually everything that we do in, at least in Western cultures and in Eastern and, and you know, um, global South um, is influenced directly or indirectly by hip hop culture in one way or another. This is a project that is 50 years old. And whether we want to admit it or not, we are all influenced in one way or another by hip hop culture. You know, if you wear Nike or Adidas, you're, you're associated with hip hop culture. If you, um, where if you use Beats headphones, you know, if you, uh, uh, you know, virtually any form of music is also influenced by hip hop music. So um, I love this, this great quote by Grandmaster Kaz where he says, you know, hip hop didn't, didn't invent anything, but it reinvented everything. So if hip hop, if we think about hip hop as a cultural phenomenon that has the power to reinvent everything, then we're thinking way beyond music. Obviously the music is part of it and it's definitely embedded within that, what I'm doing, but it's not the only thing. So the disambiguation is, 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 is really key right at the start. Uh, we have another comment from uh, Professor Kripa. She says, this is more of a thought and not a question. Your work seems to use the architectural project as a curatorial project where collectives come together. Do you see this as a way to construct the layered narratives you mentioned that trickle up into the architecture, actor, architectural theory slash pedagogy? So architectural history would include other disciplines. In my mind, this then may be our way out of the singular neoliberal servitude architecture has played to the colonial system. Um. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with, with a lot of that. Um, I think um, it is, uh, I think uh, top or uh, bottom up and top versus top down ways of addressing architecture are all, um, have been gaining a lot of momentum over the last few years, several years, and maybe even more momentum recently as we witness the kind of destructive, destructive uh, F, um, results, the destructive force that is the top-down process. Um, and architects are kind of the uh, poster children for top-down 
you know, um, everything that we laud about architecture or has been historically lauded about architecture has been tied to the singular heroic vision of the, of the hero architect. Um, and I am 100% against that. And I'm, I try to break that however I, I can in whatever way I can. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm very clear that, um, you know, in my definition of myself and my work that I have to, I definitely am starting it as a collective process first and that I'm situating myself in a larger body of work that people have been doing and thinking about for decades. Um, and really uh, focusing on how can we bring the voice of the multiple to all of these different ideas, instead of saying that, you know, I am the hip hop architect or I am the only person who does things like this or, um, you know, I, I was really very careful about creating the space of this theoretical work before I could even step into the, the space of trying to practice in that way. Um, so yeah, and, and I imagine it's definitely going to have um, ripple effects into history and theory and, um, you know, the, the early working title of the book was, um, was, was Hip Hop Architecture, History, Theory and Practice. Um, and then I dropped the subtitle because it was kind of dry and boring. But, um, but yeah, I, I imagine that the goal or the intention is that um, at the root of all of this work and of all of this thought process is that um, there are more voices to be heard. There are more people to be paid attention to. There are more ways of, of bringing architecture to life than from a singular voice. Thank you. Thank you so much. If there are no other questions, we, we will wrap this up. If there's not any closing arguments or thoughts, thank you so much, Narcis, Panache, and Shioma for helping us lead this discussion. It's like it was an honor to listen to you talk. I think the work that you're doing is incredibly important and relevant today. I know the students are our college are hungry for this kind of lecture and the, whoever missed the lecture will be watching it recorded later so thank you again so much if again if there's no other questions we'd like to digitally give you a huge round of applause <laughs> back at home there jim has a question no no i was just uh i was just um uh, i just want to thank you very much for for participating in this series and uh, and presenting such uh i think important and provocative work. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, thank you all. Thanks for, for, for hosting and for the really insightful questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm very impressed each time the questions keep getting better and better that um, people are get, it, it makes me feel like the work is being done, like people are getting more and more information about this. So thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Take care. Thank you.